as many of you have heard me say, I had to learn about emotions from my brain because this is my refuge, my thinking process. It saves me from feeling sometimes and feeling, and we're going to explore that. Why is feeling so painful or difficult or scary or any of those? Um, and we have emotions about emotions. We're going to explore all of that. And I hope at the end of this presentation that you feel inspired to think more about this topic or to feel more about this topic and certainly maybe to be braver about this topic of emotions in your own personal life as well as with clients and if you haven't figured it out yet the two now run parallel you have now grown together two different things what you do with clients and what you do with yourself and eventually they become inextricable so you might as well do well by both right and that's what this first handout is about and this handout is something that all of you, have, if you've been around me at all, have seen before, but I'm going to share it now. Um, it's an excerpt from a book actually about golf, but you can ignore that part. It's written by a man named Fred Shoemaker. There he is. The book he wrote is called Extraordinary Golf, The Art of the Possible. But this to me is a guideline, and it's a guideline that you will see um, alluded to in the presentation today. Extraordinary people live their lives backward. They stand in their future and de determine how they would like their life to be. This vision of their future gives them a way to be in the present, and their actions spring from this sense of who they are. Ordinary people simply live their past over and over again. I almost want to say that. Ordinary people simply live their past over and over again. So I'm going to stop that share right now because that's what we are talking about is what we do as counselors is we help people become extraordinary. That's our social change. We take ordinary people and we listen to their ordinary issues. We normalize them and if we do well, I think we give them a template for becoming extraordinary. So that's your mission. That's what we do. And I do believe that emotions are part of it. So now I'm going to try to share. We're going to see what happens. I'm going to try to share my screen with my PowerPoint, which is very short, but it. I think a lot of people will ignore that. Uh, I think a lot of people do better when they see, not just hear. And so I'm going to try to see if that will work. Here we go. And if I share it, can I start it from the beginning is the question. Ah, that thing's in the way. Yep. Slideshow from the beginning. There we go. OK, so Julie, just nod. Are you seeing it? I'm seeing it, but it's showing in, in the notes presentation. The wrong side. OK. Yeah. All right, so we will get out of that somehow. End slideshow. Hmm. OK. I don't want to say present in Teams, because I don't want to do that. What if I move this over here? <laughs> Trying anything I know. Let's try this. And from beginning. No, it's still doing that, isn't it? No, it looks good for us now. All right. Amazing. Okay. Excellent. So just in case you came to this and you didn't know who I am, my name is Nina Spadaro, and I am right now the School of Counseling Skills Coordinator, the primary lead for techniques class and the primary lead for pre-prac one and pre-prac two, but that's changing. I'm going to step out of that second role of pre-pracs. However, um, my, my involvement in the School of Counseling is all about skills and, and sharing them and teaching them. So I am a little bit of a skills nerd, and that's why you probably know me because you've seen Lots of things that I've done with video about skills. So 
I have four questions that I want to address in this presentation. What are emotions? What are they for? Why do they need, why do we need to become emotionally intelligent? We meaning humans. And then even a more important question is how do counselors use emotions with clients? What does this have to do with counseling? So basically, I want to start talking about what I have learned. And I have learned this from a number of sources. Um, some people that you might want to read, and there are so many names, I don't even, I'm just going to give you three. Peter Levine, Gabor Mate, um, Albert Ellis. And you probably would think, well, what does he have to do with it? But we'll talk about that as well. And another name that you will learn as soon as it comes up, um, Antonio Damasio, D-A-M-A-S-I-O. Um, he's another author. There are so many people that talk about emotions, and I have learned so much more about emotions when I added this first element, which is the basic building blocks. We get information about the world from our five senses. You know what they are. And we notice first, the most rudimentary aspect of emotion is sensation. So I'm gonna invite you for a minute to think about an emotion that you might often feel Maybe you're troubled by it, or maybe you're delighted by it. I'm because emotions come in all versions, right? But I want you to figure out where you feel it. Like if you've chosen the emotion of love, where in your body or around your body do you feel love? Very specifically, if you were to draw a gingerbread person shape, where on that person for you? Do you experience love, joy, fear, disgust, anxiety, sadness? So think about those and link it to parts of your body because you may have felt them all in the same place or as you start to really focus on sensations, you might feel them differently. For instance, some people say, I feel a restriction in my chest or an expansion, or I feel burning, or I feel pain, or I feel little sparks like electronic impulses. So even though you say, well, I feel it here, my next question to you is, what are you feeling exactly? And is it different for different emotions. Is there a big difference or not? The other day I was in a session with a client and she started, um, she was talking about something very uh, unpleasant. And she said she was really not wanting to talk about that unpleasant thing. And she, she was shaking her foot a lot and said that that's usually what happens when she thinks about that unpleasant emotion. But she, she was scratching underneath her arm and down her ribs. And I said, what are you feeling there? And she said, itching. And I want you to know that when I feel itching in this place, it usually is following an emergency, like I've almost hit somebody in a car, or I've thought about that I've almost hit somebody in a car, or some, I because I, I can spin off and create amazing, uh, amazing, frightening things in my brain. Um, and they cause a sensation in my lymph nodes that I feel. And I've come to associate that with past danger. So now I know. And I'm going to ask you to get to know your sensations because they are paired with experiences. When I was a little girl, I did not want to go to school. <laughs> now you can't get me out of it, but it's a little different. At least I do it in my home now. But I didn't want to go to school. School was a very unpleasant experience for me. It was new, it wasn't comfortable, and I did not want, since my mother wasn't allowed, it seemed, to go to school with me, I did not want to go because she was not going to be there. I 
so I found out, my mother said later, that after she'd dropped me off at the school bus and waved me goodbye, that she would go home. She wouldn't go do errands. She'd go home and wait by the phone for the next hour because somewhere in that hour, she'd probably get a phone call. Nina doesn't feel well. She feels like she's going to throw up. Come get her. And my mother came to get me. This happened a lot. And eventually I learned to associate, notice this last bullet, what fires together, wires together. I learned to associate the feeling of nausea with the feeling of fear that my mother would be mad at me because she often was, because she really wanted to have, you know, it, when you're a child, you think it's forever, but your parents only get about four hours to themselves when you're in school, even though you have six, you know, we know that. So I also started to associate a feeling of fr fright or fear and, and real panic because it had to do with attachment to my mother. My mother would get mad at me, but I needed my mother. And it was a conflicting series of emotions. Emotions get layered one upon the other and get stuck in our memory. What fires together in our brains, in our bodies, in terms of sensation, wires together. They become one and the same. So the building blocks of emotions, I'm just throwing some things out at you. I've not done this presentation before, so I'm learning myself and I really need your input. Um, as So I'm going to leave time for us to talk afterwards. So what are emotions for? Well, they give us information just like our senses do. They give us information, only we cluster it. You know, for me, school, nausea, fear clustered together. Information. They are alarm bells that are hard to ignore. I don't know if you've ever triggered your smoke alarm, but even if you're burning something on the stove, which is what might have triggered the smoking smoke alarm, you really don't want to attend to the pan on the stove. You want to stop that infernal blazing sound. And you have to do both and more, obviously. But emotions, sensations that eventually become wired together and connected into what we start to term emotions are there to alarm us, to awaken us, to alert us to something that's going on. That's all. It's very primitive. Animals experience emotions. The other animals, I should say, experience emotions. We are animals. And so we experience emotions to protect life, ours, and that of others. That's basic, simple, things that are alive want to stay alive. And so anything that seems to threaten life, and when I say threaten life, it may not be a danger that logically you think is threatening, but it doesn't matter. Changes in the world can threaten and threaten livelihood or life or the ability to move forward or to have progeny and to stay attached, which is part of our survival strategies. So, you know, we talk about attachment as a very early way that we have of surviving. Any self-respecting baby within two weeks of its life is able to have its parents wrapped around its little finger. You know, you know this. I remember somebody asking me once um, after I immediately attended to a slight sound coming from my infant that was sitting next to me. They looked at me doing that a couple of times and they said, is that your first? And I became very angry. I was like, I would do that for my 15th. So yes, it is my first and it doesn't matter. <laughs> so also anger <laughs> comes up because are you going to make fun of me and therefore stop my ability to protect my child by being cued into every single sound they make? <laughs> I saw that as some threat. So I became angry to protect life. It's a call to action to either move towards something or away. And I thought about this. Um, I saw some beautifully washed and ready blueberries sitting on my counter. 
I loved their color. I was attracted to the little round shapes and I got closer and I put some in my mouth. Okay. When we need to, when something is attractive to us, we want to have more of it. That is an emotion that we experience when we see and we have a, when we see food and have a desire for it or smell food and have a desire for it or feel it and have a desire for it. So we have emotions to pull us towards things and also to have us avoid other things. Some emotions like anger don't really generate what seem to be a purposeful action, but indeed they can turn into purposeful actions. So for instance, another animal, a bear, is looking for berries. They don't happen to live in my house, so they have to look in the woods. And they're in an area and they're hungry, they've gotten up from a long winter's nap, and they're not finding berries. So they, and they run, and then they find berries. It wasn't, I'm going to find berries if I run. It's I run and I find berries. So I learn that certain actions, certain sensations, certain emotions are associated with success. Could be success in finding food, in finding a mate, in getting away from a poison, getting away from a mate that is annoying. I saw some ducks chasing each other at a pond. They were all Twitter pated, except for the female duck. She was not interested. And she was damaging some of those male ducks with her beak, punishing them, but they didn't stop because they had that other feeling, that emotion of desire. Notice this term, it's automatic movement that occurs. So my nausea was triggered by getting on the school bus. I was actually not car sick. I was really not wanting to leave my mother. That was my fear, my concern, my entire being was meant to stay next to her. And after all, that's all I had known. So I'm going to go on to this next question. I know I'm throwing out stuff, but I'm hoping to do it and then give us some time to talk. So why be emotionally intelligent? This refers back to my initial reading. Because in order to have an extraordinary life, we have to get away from those automatic actions. And until we become intelligent, aware of, understand, listen to, welcome our emotions, we will not be able to have an extraordinary life. Hear that? That's kind of a death sentence here because we're really talking about a lot of things that have to do with coping with stress, which are, stress is inevitable, but how do you cope with stress? Your physical health, and I can pull in Bessel van der Kolk's work and all of the work done on the ACE, the Adverse Childhood Experiences measure, because it is true that people who have a score on the ACE inventory and the best is to have zeros for that whole thing but having any score on the adverse childhood experiences survey and if you're not familiar with it look it up on google you can pull it out use it with clients use it with yourself um, are more often suffering from illness people who have early trauma oftentimes have physical sequela that follow them throughout their lives. And I want to say, unless they learn, I don't believe it is a death sentence. I believe it's something that we can learn. I don't think that everybody has the same ability to learn. And I, that's part of why I want to train you all to be great counselors. That's why we all want you to learn to be great, not just average counselors, but great counselors because we give people the opportunity to live extraordinary lives by recognizing their sens senses, their sensations, their emotions, their automatic reactions paired with all of that. It's tied with success in work. It's success in society, really, because when we are emotionally intelligent, 
we can then observe other people and respond to them in intelligent ways. Very simple um, example was when that firstborn of mine went to school, he got scratched on the face by a person in his class named Joe. Actually, I changed his name. So Joe scratched his face one time. And then the next day, Joe scratched his face another time. It seems that my son inherited an attachment for his mother because when he arrived at school, he cried for me, usually for about 10 minutes. And then he got interested in other things, but he cried. And I said to him, why does Joe scratch your face? And he said to me, because I'm crying. That's like, oh, okay. So how do you know that Joe is going to scratch your face? Is there anything he does or says? And he says he comes close and he does this with his hands. And I said, okay, so how about next time? This is to my three-year-old son. How about next time you see Joe doing this with his hands, you go away from Joe. He never got scratched again because he became aware that when Joe does this, that was associated with the next action, which is he's going to scratch to try to stop my son from crying. When we teach ourselves emotional intelligence, we limit some of the negative reactions that we have and that maybe others have, depending on whose emotion we're becoming intelligent about. We have a higher chance of achieving serenity in our lives, success in work, and success in connections with friends, with family, and in love. Okay, next. As counselors, we hope to do magic and transform people who are like, like a Pinocchio puppets. Puppets who are moving in time to things that go on outside of them and instead make them real so they can respond to their own needs, their own desires, and recognize what it is they need to do by learning to listen inside to their own emotions. So how counselors use emotions with their clients, I have to say, you're probably tired of hearing me say it, is very theory-based depending on the theoretical perspective that you are applying or sense a, an affinity for will determine some of what you do. Some people seek to inform themselves about emotions, which is the approach that I take, one that I would highly recommend. And I have been accused, by the way, by other people who don't understand cognitive behavior um, theory, theory, most especially rational emotive behavior therapy, that I am trying to destroy emotions. Indeed, I do not. I welcome them. And then sometimes I help them take off their outer garb of armor and help them to understand how to sit with me and with my client. Okay, so I welcome emotions. I don't try to destroy them, but REBT is a way of doing that. So even if it's cognitive, it depends on your particular approach. But I don't believe that I try to get people to stop feeling. I think alcohol does that, drugs do that, distractions, addictions, cutting, gambling, you know, all of the addictions, sex addictions, all of that are designed to help people numb and avoid emotions. That's part of the problem. Those are the automatic associations of layers of emotions, one on the other. Um, I believe that counselors help their clients become intentional in their actions rather than act automatically. And I have a few things to say about it that I don't know where they fit. So that's where these slides go. I really think the cowardly lion is a great example of, of what we have to do. He, he actually had his emotions and he behaved anyway. He did the hard thing. He went to um, the Emerald City with Dorothy, in part because he was afraid to be away from her, but also because there was a part of him that wanted to learn how to do something different. He didn't want to be a cowardly lion anymore, which is kind of interesting because his heart was guiding his fear. 
and it was his heart that really got a lot of attention in the end, which is what I love about emotions, is that you learn about yourself and how to, how to, um, how to honor who you are and how you got where you are. So there is this concept of mixed emotions. Most of the time, what we hear from clients and ourselves are mixed emotions. Sometimes there's confusion about what emotion am I feeling? But I want to say this, your clients need to define for you what they mean when they say, I'm sad, I'm scared, I'm anxious, I'm depressed. They might use those words, but I don't know what they mean by them because each person has their own experience. And that's where it comes down to what are you sensing in your body? Where do you feel it? Does it change? Does it move? Does it have a, um, a vibration to it or is it stable or does it have colors associated with it? So all of this exploration, asking people will seem maybe to them, unless you explain it, and I do, um, kind of extraneous and odd and weird, like, okay, I now think my counselor is crazier than me. I need to find another one. It's important to explain that emotions aren't the words we use. Emotions are sensations and experiences mixed together. So sometimes people are confused about what they're saying. I've heard people who say, I'm anxious, when they're really, in my view, expressing anger and protection and not fear and worry, which is what I assume. But you see my assumptions, and that's why I want you to question yours, don't, so if a client comes in and says, I'm depressed, don't write your definite, your, your diagnosis is now depression. Find out what they mean. What is going on? What happens to them when they feel depression or what doesn't happen to them? These are important things to notice about emotions. We're really dissecting them. And sometimes mixed emotions have to do with this third line, shame about an emotion or anger about having an emotion or fear of having an emotion. We can also be sad about having an emotion. So oftentimes we have emotions about emotions. And I know that some of you have been dabbling in some of the um, uh, sensory motor kinds of therapy, um, you're dabbling in internal family systems. I am speaking to all of you, I hope, because I'm trying to explain emotions from a, what I do, which is I dissect things. I dissect skills and I dissect emotions um, from a more nuts and bolts or ABC perspective. When we have shame about an emotion, it's because we have learned that something might be judged about us as lacking or deficient when we have that emotion. That was my case with my attachment to my mother. I learned to be ashamed of being worried about losing her. I couldn't say I'm worried about you. What I did know, however, later in life is that whether or not my nausea level wasn't such that I had to leave school that day was determined, it seems, by whether or not my mother lingered at the bus stop and continued waving until I could no longer see her, or whether she turned around before the bus rounded the corner and I saw her back. What does that have to do with nausea? Well, I pictured my mother was on that corner waving to me all day while I was at school. <laughs> and if she turned around, she was gone. And once she was gone, I was alone. I was in danger. I was not safe. And I needed something. And I knew that I was, I was feeling sick. And interestingly, then becoming nauseous helped me get reconnected. So emotions have connections with experience and automatic actions that are sometimes happening when we, um, when we need something. Um, I'm going to talk about protection in a minute, but this is talking about layered emotions. 
So as we explore people's emotions, we might find ones that are lower. Now, are all, this is what I hear, and I don't believe it. Anger is a secondary emotion. Anger covers vulnerable emotions, always. I don't believe so. I believe that anger is its own emotion and it has its own place in life. I think anger moves us to do social justice. Anger can move us to take care of our family, to do things that we might not ordinarily be brave enough to do and then find empowerment in them. Sometimes we have to become angry. And, and I'll talk about becoming angry and feeling anger in a minute. Okay, so I'm hopefully piquing your interest in this is not too confusing, but I'm going to go and talk now about protection from a past emotion. When, when I felt nauseous, I was in danger of throwing up. Throwing up became in and of itself something that became very abhorrent to me because it felt very out of control. And it is, it's a physical reaction. You can't control your, your stomach heaving. So I learned that I needed to protect myself from feeling nauseous. And in so doing, I developed fear. Fear helped to protect me from getting nauseous because fear then caused me to do something that I was afraid, like I would be afraid that my mother would become angry. And so then my fear turned into something that caused me to think I had to tell the teacher I was sick and then set in motion what I needed. So sometimes secondary emotions protect us by setting in motion a series of actions. And we need to learn to welcome and understand our emotions, by the way. OK, so let me see. I want to talk about and this is not on a slide or not on the next slide. Um, making a welcome place. Well, no, it is. Yes, it is. The next slide. Sorry, here it is. OK. Which one of those is the counselor? <laughs> hopefully the angel we allow people to experience emotions and protect them and give them a space that's what the sheltering wings are all about we allow them to experience them without shaming them and how you shame someone who has a negative emotion or even an intense emotion is by immediately jumping to the conclusion that they want to get rid of that intensity. Instead of asking them, is it okay for you to feel that? What's not okay? Let's talk about that. Okay, so you don't want to throw up. Got that. Okay. Can you invite that emotion to not scream at you but let's listen to what it's saying to you instead of causing you so much nausea that you want to throw up. If we sit together and don't try to make it go away, but just notice, just get curious about that emotion. Can it tell you what it wants, what it needs, what it desires, what you want, what you need, what you desire? without taking over and being nauseous, can you notice nauseous? Can you listen to and become aware of nauseous? This is one way that we offer sheltering wings. We let people feel what they're gonna feel and do it. And let me tell you, it's so much more relaxing for me as a counselor to allow that and to be there. You cannot win a power struggle over an emotion. We try to do that inside ourselves when we have the more um, primitive way of dealing with emotions. I'm going to squash it. I'm going to take Valium. I'm going to drink alcohol. Well, in the end, that's a losing battle. 
because you can't take enough Valium. You can't drink enough without, um, without endangering your life, quite honestly. So you cannot win the power struggle and live, which is what we really all need to do. We can use emotions as fuel for actions and not be them. What I really should have put on here is de-identify yourself from the emotion. I am angry. Nope. You're angering right now. By the way, that comes from reality therapy. Bob Wubbleton used, used that. I'm anxieting right now. I'm depressing myself right now. Um, I'm saddening myself right now. And if you get people to just try on that language, at first they might become uh, defensive because they think you're shaming them. But make it clear, no, that anxiety is welcome in the room. It just doesn't have to take over everything that you're experiencing. It can be your right hand, your right arm. And do something positive with that anger. Learn to punch. Learn to, learn to throw discs. Learn to climb mountains with that energy that you have. So emotions can be used as fuel, and we can teach people about that. And then there is that sense of naming that's so important. Remember Rumpelstiltskin? He was that curious little dwarf who wanted the firstborn child of the miller's wife, or the miller's daughter, after he gave her the ability to magically turn straw into gold. And she promised him that because she was afraid. She'd do anything, right? She'd promise her firstborn child, not realizing that she might become attached to that child and not want to give it up. So Rumpelstiltskin finally gave in and said, okay, I'll, I'll grant you that wish that I won't take your firstborn if you learn my name. Now, learning Rumpelstiltskin's name was very difficult. Learning to name emotions, the right ones, and all of them is very difficult. It doesn't take magic talking mice, but it might take a magical talking therapist. It might take a therapist that has learned the words for emotions themselves. So it is super important that we learn the magic, which are the words, and sometimes we try. When we do reflections of feeling, I've, you've heard it from me and others, you don't have to be perfect at it. You just try. And once you start trying and you give them the list too, how many times have I sent the list of feeling words to my clients? I mean, I, I do get more than a quarter for it. So I am a wealthy woman as a result, um, but I don't sell them. It's just part of the counseling. I help people name Rumpelstiltskin in all of his glory, in all of his weirdness and curiousness and uniqueness. We all have unique feelings. And when we name them, we have power over them. That doesn't mean we eliminate, eliminate them. Rumpelstiltskin did stamp himself a hole down into Hades and was never heard from again. But we will hear from those emotions again. I make that really clear. And when you do, go, oh, I wonder why. I'm feeling this now. It enables people to go through what I call the inevitable learning process, the spiral of change, of relapse. And eventually, you never stop relapsing into anything. You just learn to be good at it. So that as soon as you feel that or start doing that, you start going, why? What's going on? What do I need? And you take care of the real need and needs. There may be more than one. So there's an old um, acronym that I learned in 12-step programs, HALT. H-A-L-T. It stands for Hungry, Angry, Lonely, or Tired. It's just a nice little acronym, and you can probably make your own for your clients. But HALT means stop. And in addictions work, when people start to feel hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, they're in danger of giving in to their addictions. What do they need to do? Well, you need to stop. No, <laughs> you need to eat. Do something with that angry energy. Maybe take yourself for a run or do some hard work that you've been putting off for a while because you didn't want to 
you know, you just didn't want to. And then at the end, you've built that wall or dug that hole, replanted that tree. If you're lonely, call someone 24 seven in the fellowship of many 12 step programs. There's someone who will talk to you. Somebody shared a poem with me the other night about the sleepless. If all the sleepless people in the middle of the night had a place that they'd all go to, they'd probably meet a lot of really cool people because there are a lot of us who are sleepless because of emotions or kids or stress or who knows what, right? Or just because we sleep in two pieces. So don't be lonely. And if you're tired, rest. So I'm going to stop here and say thank you for attending and all of that and stop sharing. And I do appreciate your being here. Now I want to know what you're thinking.